We have uh, two great speakers tonight. Uh, we have Denesha uh, Seth Carley. She grew up on a small organic farm in West Virginia. And uh, she is now an associate professor in the Department of Horticultural Science here at NC State University. She is the director of the NSF Center for Integrated Pest Management. Her area of expertise is sustainable management or managed urban landscapes with a research and extension focus on creating and enhancing pollinator habitat. Uh, recent research programs include pollen quality in commonly planted wildflowers, pollinator ecology along roadsides in North Carolina, and native plant conservation and pollinator habitat establishment at historic Pinehurst number two and number four golf courses. In addition to grant writing, which sounds like a lot of fun, uh, and research. Uh, she frequently lectures at beekeeper association meetings, uh, master gardener meetings, and other events where community members are interested in learning more about pollinator habitat and conservation and protection. And that's, of course, what we're here for tonight. And she is currently working on her second book. I guess the first one wasn't torture enough, was it? No, uh, and unfortunately, I don't have a partner for the second book. My partner for the first one was amazing. So I was like, uh, how hard could it be? Oh, no. <laughs> and tonight's second speaker is Ann Spafford. And Ann is also an associate professor here in the Department of Horticultural Science at NC State University. She is trained in horticulture and landscape architecture. And she teaches many landscape design courses that attract not only majors, but students across campus. She strategically uses real world projects in her design studios, which enable her students to research, design, and implement projects such as pollinator habitats. These projects then inform the campus community and the greater community at large about how to create landscape designs that can and should help mitigate environmental and social issues. Anne is a member of the Academy of Outstanding Teachers at NC State University and recently received the Alumni Association Distinguished Undergraduate Professor Award. This is her second book that she's talking about today. As you can tell, we're in great hands with Anne and Denesha. Thank you so very much for being here tonight. Thank you for that incredibly warm welcome. Uh, Ann and I are just thrilled to be in person with you all this evening. And if you're online, we're glad that you're there too. We're very comfortable with that format as well. All right, without further ado, let's just jump right on in and talk about pollinator gardening. So I'm pleased finally to ask this question and then ask for a show of hands. How many of you would agree that 100% of the critters on this slide are pollinators? Can I get a show of hands? All right, if you raise your hand, then you are 100% accurate. Anything that moves pollen from one flower to another flower can be considered a pollinator, technically. But in this case, you may see some very familiar pollinators. Up there in the top, uh, your top left, is our honeybee, Apis mellifera. Most folks are very familiar with our honeybee, very important to American agriculture, of course. But a lot of you, when asked about pollinators, would also probably say our lepidopterans, whether they're butterflies or moths. Most people would recognize our hummingbirds and even bats, but some less familiar pollinators are also on this slide. Flies, believe it or not, this is actually called a hoverfly or bee mimic. You can see why. And this ugly little critter, this blowfly, is also a pollinator. Flies are actually the second most efficient pollinator second only to bees, of course, bumblebees, honeybees, and other bees. But beetles, wasps, and even lizards can also be pollinators. I also like to say that my dog, who likes to walk directly through my flower bed, can technically also be a pollinator. <laughs> For agriculture, if you like to eat, as I do, the American honeybee, I'm sorry, Apis mellifera, our honeybee, is going to be the most important bee for agricultural purposes. One estimate of the contribution of honeybees to American consumers is over $1.6 billion. You frequently hear the number that, you know, one out of every three bites is pollinated by bees. That isn't technically true, but they do contribute to agriculture in a way that does contribute a tremendous amount to whether it's um, strawberries or almonds or apples or many different commodities that you might even not consider pollinator plants. Uh, th these little bees and other bees that we're gonna talk about are absolutely required for pollination in order to get apples, almonds, and even chocolate. Although chocolate is not pollinated by bees, they're pollinated by well, uh, flies. Native bees are also really important. Remember, the honeybee is not native to North America. 
And if you get through the first chapter in our book, you'll understand the whole trials and tribulations of how bees uh, ended up here in North America. But we do have a number of native bees here that are also equally important. And some are familiar to you already, and some might be less familiar to you. There are over 4,000 native bee species, and they tend to be what we call solitary bees, meaning they live alone. You're probably familiar with bumblebees who, they are not solitary, they do live in colonies. But other than that, we have a helictus here, you might recognize. Agapostamon, also known as the sweat bee, those are the metallic bees. And then this really large bee that might be sometimes uh, mistaken for a wasp, Megachile. We're truly unique in North Carolina that we have one of the most diverse native bee populations in the entire United States. We have over 500 bees. Interestingly enough, we also have one of the most diverse agricultural systems with over 90 commodities that we grow in North Carolina. I think, but do not know, they're probably related. <laughs> Now bees, when they visit your flowers, are looking for nectar. Actually, they're looking for the sugar in those nectars. And then they're looking for pollen, of course, and what they get from that is protein and fat. So when we talk about pollinator gardening, I want you to think about each and every one of those beautiful flowers that you're planting in your garden as like a little drive-in for our bees. Unfortunately, and this is probably something many of you are aware of already, Bee populations, not just Apis mellifera, the honeybee, but native bees as well, are also in decline. And this is sort of a global problem. Some places it's worse than others, but whether it's here in Raleigh in North Carolina, or whether it's in China or Vietnam, in general, population, populations of bees are in decline. There are a lot of factors that do contribute to this decline. Of course, I have them here on this chart. You can read them yourselves, but I will tell you that in many cases, diseases and pests as attack humans, so attack bees as well, although they are different diseases and different pests in many cases. Climate change, you know, um, whether it's uh, driving additional storms, hurricanes, uh, large winds, or just change in temperature gradations can affect populations. And then of course, direct, indirect or misuse of pesticides can also, of course, damage populations, whether it's, you know, killing them because you've sprayed the bees by accident or, God forbid, on purpose. But in many cases, what happens is bees will come into contact with pesticides in landscapes or in agriculture, and it will cause their general sort of general malaise for those bees, and then they're less healthy moving forward. So it stresses them out essentially. It's similar to the human immune system where when we get stressed, we're more likely to get sick. Also a, a big contributing factor is loss of feeding and nesting habitat. That is primarily due to urbanization. The reason I have that in green is to say of all these things, and there are many and it can feel really large and somewhat a little you know, overwhelming. But we, everyone in this room and everyone online and your neighbors and your grandkids and your friends, every one of us can contribute to the reduction of loss in feeding and nesting habitats because we're all gonna go home and plant lots and lots of flowers for our bee friends. How do we do that? Well, I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> um, I am gonna give you a few tips, just general broad tips about what you wanna keep in mind when you're gardening for bees. Now I say bees, because bumblebees are my very, very favorite little critter. However, when I say bees, I don't only mean bees. If you love butterflies or you love moths or you love bats, almost everything Ann and I talk about are friendly to Lepidopteran or to beetles or to flies, if that's your jam. But because bees are my jam, I mostly just say bees, but you can insert your favorite pollinator anytime I say bees. So what's the first thing to remember? Be diverse, get creative. Interestingly enough, our urban landscapes can be truly diverse. The more diverse our landscapes are, the more habitat, the more nutrition, the more robust the populations and the more diverse the bee populations are as well. One thing we like to recommend is when you're planting plants rather than planting individual plants in your garden, and I don't know, um, anyone who necessarily 
well, other than me, maybe when I see one plant and I'm like, I have to have that plant and I stick it in the ground. But most of the time, the best thing to do is to plant in clumps where you're buying a couple plants at a time. You can see in this picture, we have the solidago, the goldenrod. That's not one plant, of course, it's about four or five and they came out this way. We have the cosmos in the back, the monarda here also grouped and planted together. Why, you might ask, should we do this? There are a number of types of bees, honeybees are one of them, who actually prefer to visit a single type of flower or, or floral resource, right? And only collect pollen from that single uh, plant species. So when you buy honey that says sourwood honey, how do we know it's all sourwood pollen and nectar? Because when those bees went out into the forest, that's what they were foraging on. Uh, bumblebees are less so like that. Um, they're more generalists where they just sort of catch as catch can. But honeybees in particular like to, to do what is called floral constancy, meaning that they prefer if they're out foraging on solidago, this goldenrod pollen, they prefer to go and only go out for that in their, in their flight out and then come back with only solidago pollen. So if we plant in clumps, we just make it easier on those little ladies when they're out flying and working so hard. I always recommend keeping records of when things are blooming. You guys are all here because you're plant people. You probably already keep records. I am old school. I actually keep a notebook or um, actually I see a few of you even taking notes in our book. I also write notes in my book when I'm out and about on plants that I've seen, plants that I'm interested in. Then I always have a written record. Anne has a neat trick she's probably gonna share with you later um, about how she keeps records and dates. This is my trick. It's called the old notebook and pen trick. But as you're walking around your neighborhood or you're here at the Arboretum walking around, which I hope you do frequently, you see plants that you like, write them down. Think about how they might fit into your landscape if you enjoy them. Don't worry too much about what your neighbor has planted or what you read on Facebook about what those bees like. Bees don't read Facebook, okay? So they don't know what Facebook says bees are supposed to like. Don't be afraid to try new things. If you're out here and you're looking at plants and you see it as covered in bees, guess what? Bees like that plant. Don't be afraid to try new plants and go a little bit off script. Anne and I have some fabulous lists in our book, but it is not the end all be all of lists. We've put those lists in the book because we both have valid evidence, scientific as well as anecdotal, that those plants are truly good bee forage plants, which means they're rich in either nectar, pollen, or both. But again, bees don't read our books. So there are other plants out there that aren't in our book that bees like as well. So don't be afraid to sort of try new, try new things. I talked about honeybees and bumblebees, they're social bees, they all grow together, live together in big colonies. And with honeybees, we do this really cool thing where we put them in their very own house and they come back to it every day, every evening they tuck in when they come back. But solitary bees have to make their own house, their own place to nest. Some of them do indeed nest in the ground. Those are called nesting bees, ground nesting bees. Some of them prefer to actually use hollowed stems from grasses or twigs. And then you've probably seen these, these are called bee hotels or insect hotels. Actually, there are bees that will use all these different resources, all different types of bees will use different types of resources in which to lay their eggs to protect them from the winter so that they can spring forth in the, in the spring. So one really great um, project that you can do with a young person or a scout club or a school group is to just gather resources and build an insect hotel. Um, Nationalgeographic.org actually has a really great how-to online guide on how to build your very own. I think that's a really great resource if you're at all interested. Really easy project and a lot of fun. We have some pictures of these different types in the books. In the book, I'm sorry, but um, almost all of them in some fashion get used. And again, they just look really cool if, if you've got them um, sort of artsy in the garden as well. Remember there are some bees that need to be able to nest in the ground. So I, for environmental reasons, but also for bee reasons, like to recommend if you can skip heavy mulch, even in just some areas, because I understand mulch 
can really make a big difference in keeping those weeds down, right? But if you can forego heavy mulch in areas where you notice bee activity, we really would recommend not using heavy mulch in those areas. And especially try not to use plastic if you can in your garden. It's, it's not good for the environment and it's really not good for the bees. And then as I already mentioned, it's really nice to leave some grasses and Anne's gonna talk about which types of grasses and what you might look for when you're looking for grasses to put into your garden and why you might use grasses, right? Because of course they don't have nectar or pollen that bees use, but they do use those stems to nest in. So also something important to consider. And then, and you know, I come, you guys heard my bio, I come from a turf grass background. I'm, uh, I'm not anti-turf grass. I like having a little plot of zoysia in my front yard, but I've also, I'm also a big fan of considering removing some of that grass that is potentially high maintenance and less good for the environment and increasing the amount of other things that you're gonna put in your yard. Anne has some really beautiful ideas of how to, uh, expand the area in your yard, even if you are in an area that you have an HOA where they might be a little fussy about how much yard you can remove. Anne's going to talk a little bit about how you can do that in a really creative way and still increase your pollinator garden area while leaving turf grass. For me, I don't have an HOA. I've just kind of let my yard go wild. I do mow it regularly, but for me, I've, I end up leaving what other people might call weeds. I call bee brood material dandelions. Other people would call these weeds, I call them nitrogen fixers. So sometimes it's just a matter of rethinking what's in your lawn and what, what makes up a lawn. In my case, this is a picture of my lawn, which you can see is mostly clover and a bunch of weeds, but these weeds are a really wonderful poll pollinator habitat. Seasonality. Seasonality is incredibly important when we're talking about promoting and conserving pollinators. Many pollinators come out in the early spring. Their life cycle goes all the way. They're still out there now. I was working in my garden this morning and the asters were just covered in three, four, five different species of bees. You'll see they're out there still working, collecting nectar and pollen for their brood right now. So as long as there are plants growing and flowers out there, we're gonna have bees working those flowers. So we wanna think about planting so that bees on different cycles still have access to that sugary nectar for their energy and their pollen, which they, um, in most cases, feed their young. When you think about what to plant, you wanna plant flowers that, that offer both and or right? Both nectar and pollen or one or the other. And we usually say you want to make sure that you've got stuff out there for them early March, sort of when you start seeing the first red buds pop open or the first sugar maples start to drop their little flowers. We've got bumblebee, uh, honeybees that are coming right out of the ground, ready to start foraging. So, so it's really important to think about seasonality as you plan your garden. Anne's going to talk more about that, so I'm not going to cover any more of that. Like people and animals, pollinators have three basic needs. They need a space to live. That's pretty much easy to remember, right? They need food. We've already talked about that. When you plant flowers that provide pollen, nectar, or both, you're providing habitat and you're providing food for those bees or butterflies or beetles, whatever your favorite pollinator is. Something we don't always think about, but can be included in your garden as sort of an artistic element or just a creative element is a watering station. And you can, you can do that in a way that does not promote mosquitoes, right? When you say water, the first thing I think of in, in an urban area is, well, I don't want mosquitoes in my standing water, right? Any of these are shallow enough that mosquitoes are not gonna be enticed to lay their eggs and you won't get larvae, which means you don't get additional mosquitoes. But the nice thing is they're also shallow enough that your, whether it's your lepidopterin, your butterflies or your bees can still land and get a, a much needed drink. I didn't used to have this slide in here, 
But at the end of every single talk, without fail, people would say, well, what's your favorite pollinator flowers? It's like trying to pick a favorite kid. How do you do that? But you asked, so here it is. For my garden, right? And there are so many wonderful flowers and so many wonderful plants that are pollinator friendly. And there are so many different reasons to choose the plants that you choose. And Anne, of course, as the designer, really has a true eye for what goes together, why you might plant something where you plant them. And um, I just, uh, I always tell Anne, I have the yes, please approach. If I like it, I see it. Yes, please, I'm gonna stick that in my garden. So these are some of the plants that are in my garden that I love, love, love to see pollinators on because they're so rich in pollen, nectar, or both. You've got your mountain mints. I don't know why, but there are sort of two different types of mountain mint. I think Anne is gonna talk about that as well. It's a really unassuming, but really lovely plant. Draws a tremendous diversity of pollinators to it. Blooms for a long time. All of these are natives, super easy to grow, low maintenance, and they're not bossy. Of course, the purple coneflower, one of my all time favorites. I love it not only because it's so pretty, it offers so much uh, rich nectar and pollen for our pollinator friends. But also, if you let it go to seed and you don't tr trim the heads off of them, deadhead it, <laughs> then uh, this time of year, you'll start to see goldfinch and other seed-eating birds land on them. So you're providing additional habitat for birds, even though they're not pollinators. I'm a big fan of birds too. Butterfly weed, this is Asclepias tuberosa, but any of the Asclepias are wonderful recommend any and all of them, you cannot go wrong. The asters, I was telling Chris earlier that I have an aster in my yard that is uh, over six feet tall. I know, cause I am not yet six feet tall and probably never will be. <laughs> <laughs> I aspire to be taller, um, but it is over my head. And it is one of the, the spreadiest asters I've ever seen. I always thought asters should be like nice and compact and tidy, but nobody told the asters that. So this aster is one single aster and it is huge. But right now it is completely covered in bees. They just were making the aster dance. There's a toad right here, a little toad. You're not a pollinator. Uh, I would like to save the toad. Yeah, sorry, buddy. He's right here. Can you save the little toad? Well, don't blind him. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Oh, I wasn't hitting him with the laser. Don't worry. Well, thank you for trying to save the wildlife. I'm a big fan. Thank you. I actually was giving a talk, and it might have been to your group, your garden group, one time. And I was talking about pests in the garden. And no joke, the stink bug as I was talking about pests, landed right in the center of the screen. It was hysterical, it was like I had planned it. I was like, and there's a stink bug. There was not a stink bug picture on the screen, but the stink bug, it just landed right in the center of the screen. Okay, back on track. Gallardia, another one of my favorites. Um, it, it can, uh, you know, this is, this plant is not for everyone. It is a perennial, all these in fact are. It will come back year after year, but it is, it is vibrant, it is loud. I just love it to death, but um, I can understand why it might not be for everybody. <laughs> so uh, people also tend to ask, well, you know, all of the flowers that I talked about there, and I think 90% even of the plants that we have in the book are sun loving plants. Well, why is that? Pollinators really like warmth. They need warmth in order to be able to fly, to move around. And so we tend to think about sunny plants for sunny locations, for insects that like sun. But they will forage in the shade. There are some really lovely shade plants. And I'm, I know I'm probably going, since I had that toad escapade, I'm probably going way long. But uh, Lenten Rose is one of my all-time favorites. It's an early bloomer. It comes back year after year after year. And has this beautiful leathery forage uh, foliage that sticks around all year round. Wild bergamo is nice. You can see that bumblebee right there foraging on that. Um, I've never had problems with powdery mildew in the shade, but some Monarda do. So that's why we tend to recommend planting Monarda in the sun, just to keep that powdery mildew at bay. Wild geranium not shown, golden Alexander's not shown, but um, they're also both, the golden Alexander's especially are an early bloomer and they're wonderful in a garden. 
also native. And then of course you can't go wrong with shrubs. I'm just naming two here, the Clethra and the Father Gila. Wrapping it up, just a few more things. If you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember mm -hmm. this. Try to avoid the modern hybrid flowers. These dahlias are stunning in person. They're beautiful. Someone earlier today, and I can't remember, I'm sorry, who was mentioning that they had been to the fair today and seen the dahlias. Some of them can be, and in fact, this one was as big as my head, maybe even bigger. They're absolutely gorgeous and showy, but <clears throat> because of the way they've been bred with these double flowers, they do not make pollen, or if they do make pollen, insects cannot get in to get the pollen. So they just don't make good pollen pollinator habitat even though they are ab obviously very stunning in a garden. This goes without saying, but common sense is not common. So I just wanna mention, you know, it, especially if you have bees flying, don't use pesticides or herbicides of any kind in your yard. Maybe even consider putting up a sign, especially if you have bees or, so just to remind your neighbors gently that you have bees and if they're gonna spray, they need to do it maybe in the late evening, which people don't like to do, but. If the bees aren't out, they're a lot less likely to come in contact with that pesticide. And then it's always a nice idea to include larval host plants. Um, I always, this is a picture of my garden. I always plant dill, fennel, and parsley. I tell my husband it's so that I can use the herbs in potato salad in the summer. That's a total bald face lie. It's so that I can grow these beautiful little caterpillars. And then I go and I buy, you know, my herbs at the grocery store because they usually just clean me out and just strip the leaves. But I really don't mind because I like seeing the caterpillars. And then this is an Asclepius, a common milkweed, which I also like to put in my garden. Okay, so something we talk about in the book, no matter what your garden space looks like, the bees don't mind if it's messy. They don't care if there are weeds. They don't care how big or how small. It doesn't matter to the pollinators. Any space can be pollinator habitat space. And you can be a pollinator champion with something as little as a, a pot on your patio. So I told you how, and Anne is gonna tell you how to take that how to wow. Okay. So thank you everybody for hanging in. Hopefully this, the toads will stay <laughs> at bay. So I, I teach all the time and we are dealing with, you know, climate change and all these other environmental issues. And I think a lot of homeowners are usually overwhelmed about what it is they can do in their home landscape and in their home garden. And they think, I think they probably doubt about how much impact they can actually have. But I'm putting this slide up just to, to take that message home, right? So we think about urban settings. Um, the interactions with nature and benefits of natural processes occur predominantly in small scale or residential settings, right? There are, as you probably know, there's this huge housing boom, right? So there's 1 million new single family residences added to urban areas across the US each year. And I don't know if you know this, but like 75 people a day move to the triangle area. And most of those um, people will buy like single family detached houses, all with yards, right? So numerous small solutions, such as reducing turf, reducing stormwater runoff, landscape to conserve energy, et cetera, et cetera, are feasible ways of tackling these environmental problems. And can, they can be implemented in a relatively short time frame, right? When you think about these big projects, they probably have the most impact. But actually, if you think about residential properties, the speed at which those design projects can be implemented and the impact of residential properties in aggregate, the impact is profound, right? So never underestimate the impact that you can have in your own home garden. Now, unfortunately, not all front yards can look like this. Do you like this picture or no, right? I usually get like a mixed bag, right? Those of us who are all about pollinators and uh, doing like high performing landscapes, which is really the name of the game, right? We always talk about landscapes should provide X number of functions. And if they're designed well, they should of course be beautiful. But if they can create more pollinator habitat or reduce stormwater management, um, or you know, reduce stormwater issues, that's always good. 
So this is a fabulous idea in theory, probably very hard to actually get this into a neighborhood here, particularly a new neighborhood, a subdivision, got this weird HOA, probably not gonna happen. So it's really how do we do the best environmental decisions in a way that um, is doable in our neighborhoods. So one of the things is say tackling a pollinator habitat in your front yard. So the easiest thing to do is perhaps tackle your front foundation plantings, right? Um, those are the plantings that we have across the front of houses to like soften the connection of where the house meets the ground, soften the architecture. Um, they tend to be pretty minimal. Of course, you guys are a very plant oriented group. You probably have amazing foundation plantings, right? But a lot of times they're sort of ho-hum. You don't need to really change that. You can just add on to it, right? So here's a plan view or bird's eye view of say a very traditional new construction foundation planting. So the house is up there at the top, got a row of shrubs in, in the front, and then the one lone tree in the front yard. That's what contractors are required to put in for new construction. Very bare bones, uninteresting. Maybe those plants are fabulous, chances are they're probably not that magical, right? So you don't need to change that. Let's say they're not so bad plants. All you need to do is extend the planting beds out, right? So in this plan, all those plants that I just showed you, they're still there, whatever they are. I'm just adding in these pollinator friendly plants, right? And what's cool about this is you can do this over time, right? So you just bought a house, all your money's gone temporarily. So as you phase in a garden, you can do a little bit at a time. That's what's so cool about landscaping. You can continually add a little at a time and the garden just keeps looking better and better. It's not, doesn't have to look incomplete at any one time. So this is just bumping out the beds a little bit. You can take it even farther. Maybe this is in another year, right? And now we're bringing out that planting bed all the way around to capture that tree. So now you're making the pollinators really happy with so many more plants, but you're also now reducing quite a bit more turf, less to mow, who doesn't love that? And now you also don't have to mow around that tree, right? So again, it's making management of that landscape even easier. So the next thing is just picking your planting design strategy. So the room's a little dark. I'm sorry, I can't see the people online. But show of hands, how many people find these images attractive? Okay, so there's actually quite a few people in this room. That's awesome. So people tend to be a little more split, right? We all tend to be very plant astute in this room. We're like, yeah, plants, whatever it is. We love it, right? <laughs> Just give me any free plant you can, right? However, if you try to put these landscape strategies in someone's front yard, like in a newly constructed neighborhood, it'd be a hard sell. And actually this is in a neighborhood up in Toronto. This is an ecologist's garden, right? So of course, I mean, all of these gardens are environmentally sound. They support pollinators, other wildlife. They're native plants that should historically be in these locations, right? However, most people will have an issue with these designs, right? And a lot of people will say, well, I don't like native plant gardens. These are all native plant gardens, but that's really not a native plant issue. It's a design issue. And so interestingly enough, there's research out there that shows people really love the idea of nature when they're in nature. When it comes to a neighborhood, it's like, oh, no, no. We like to see a little more control, a little more neatness, tidiness. Uh, you guys might be quite different, but that's a lot of times what happens. I teach a, um, a design class for non-majors in the summer, and I have them start by finding pictures of landscapes online that they find attractive. And then they have them tell me like three descriptors of why they find those pictures interesting. Neat, clean, tidy and this is like it spans many ages but it's like you realize you're outside right <laughs> this is an outdoor environment it doesn't have to be neat and clean 
But that's what a lot of people are looking for. Over the years, it's expanded somewhat, but it always surprises me because I think it should be, I'm always expecting it's beautiful, it's colorful, it's vibrant. No, neat, clean, tidy, right? So, but it's a design issue. You can do any plants you want, but it's a design issue. And what we really want to get to is um, bridging ecological design and the aesthetics of good landscape design. And so we always talk about creating sustainable landscape designs. Like, what does that mean? I think it's, it's become such a buzzword that no one really defines it anymore. But in order for something to be truly sustainable, it has to be environmentally sound, it has to be economically viable, and it has to be socially responsible. You have to include the culture. Um, and so that's where aesthetics can come in, right? And so we need to actually bridge these two things. So ecological design says we should have high plant diversity. That's generally what nature would do on its own, right? No monocultures. This idea of turf, oh my gosh, is so high management, doesn't really do a lot ecologically. And then having layers of plant types to support insect and animal ecology, right? So that's good principles of ecological design. On the landscape design side of things, we tend to create, uh, people are looking for structure, something that looks obviously made, something intentional, something deliberate. And we're looking for something that contains at least some neat and orderly elements. Now, if you really like the wild gardens on the last slide, don't worry. That doesn't mean you can't have that. It's just a slightly different way of approaching that. Okay, another quick poll. What do you guys think about these images? How many love these? Yeah, yeah like almost everybody in the room is saying yes. And so would you say these are better than the last images? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. okay, I don't know if you guys heard that. It's like, amen, absolutely, right? So what's the difference? I'm asking, just throw out, throw out a reason. So diversity, right? If we go back, I'm not gonna mess this up, but um, thank you. <laughs> um, so if we went back to other ones, it was a lot of one thing and it was just sort of inter, uh, mixed up. But here, even though it's a lot of different things, there's an order, right? There are big clumps, like what Dinesha talked about, right? So we see this big band of something and then the big band of something else and then the big band of grass, right? These are all Pete Rudolph designs, right? So very human built, not at all natural. However, the majority of people who see these absolutely love them. So how is that so different than this, right? So there's really no order here. And the thing is, when we look at these, A, our eye doesn't know where to go. We, our brains actually love to tackle a scene and figure it out. It's like, it's trying to find some order. It's trying to think, oh, do I recognize that? Yes, I've seen that before. So repetition is important, but in a way that it kind of leads us through the scene. We also need to think about seasonality. So when we look at these, there's a lot going on here right now, but it's all the same color. Awesome if you love yellow, very sad if you don't like yellow, but there's probably not a lot to carry the garden through the winter. We don't know what's going on in the spring. This is a, gar this is a garden on campus and it always looks like a hot mess, unfortunately, but it, it is ecological and it supports birds, et cetera, et cetera, but it just is not appealing, but there's no reason why it can't, right? So if we go back to these, we see diversity, but there's some order here. Plus we see large massings of grasses. Guess what? They still provide winter interest, right? Because they go dormant. Sorry, it's hard for me to <laughs> take a breath in my mask. I get so excited, I talk fast and I'm like dying underneath here. So you see big masses of grasses, right? So they go dormant, but the form is still there in the winter. The size is still there, still blows in the wind and it rustles, right? So it's amazing, right? So all of these are much more palatable visually, right? People will get on board with this. What about these? Everybody likes these as well? Okay, so how are these different than that? 
it's kind of mixed up and wild, right? But there's something about, so yeah, there is repetition, right? So we might see uh, similar flower forms. Again, some subtle repetition of color, right? So there's this color, this color, this color, they're all in the same family. The purples kind of speak to one another as you look at the design. But there's also this idea of contrasting textures, right? So in that, that first slide with all the yellows, it's all the same wispy, wispy texture, right? In the slide up top, from particularly, you see like a giant wide leaf, and then you see some fine textured things, and your eye goes right there. Your brain is almost like it's pre-wired for contrast. So that is acceptable in many people's like aesthetic preferences, right? These are also Pete Udolf designs. He started doing um, masses like this, and he sort of evolved to do this intermingled thing, right? So again, going back to that yellow slide, it's a lot of the same texture. Again, nothing to really capture your eye and hold it. However, when you look at here, your eye goes right to that big wide leaf because it's right next to things that are fine textured. So it's thinking about picking plants intentionally. And are you contrasting textures? Are you repeating colors, et cetera, et cetera? So it all comes down to really good planting design, right? Height. And, and height, right? Although you can, um, like it looks like there's so many things that are the same height in that top image, but there's so much diversity, right? Um, but that's usually a good thing to work into if you've got the room to do that, because then your eye kind of like bounces around through the whole design, absolutely. So um, in the book, we have lots of really cool design information. So let's just say you really love the wild, crazy design, totally fine. All you need to do is give it like a neat and tidy edge. Maybe it's a low evergreen ground cover. Maybe it's a dwarf, um, a native holly, right? So if you're still going all native, that's fine. As long as you have some containment or at least even on one side and have the wildness behind, people see that as intentional. And then all is good, all is right with the world, right? Um, we tend to also design with our perennials anyway, with large masses like this up at the top right drawing, which is fine. However, if you think through, what does that plant mass look like through the seasons? Is it, does it go dormant or is there gonna be a big hole there in the winter? And if you don't like that idea, then you wanna redesign the bed a little bit. So uh, we really like recommending these layered bands. And this is actually, it's not our idea originally. It's uh, Gertrude Jekyll, right? This fabulous English designer from the late 1800s. Um, she designed all of the really gorgeous perennial borders like this, right? So when let's say one band comes up and does its thing, when it goes away, because it's a narrow or sliver, as long as you have something showy in front or behind it, you don't know that it's gone, right? So it's really clever. And that way you don't end up with one giant gaping hole in your garden, right? Really super clever thing to do. So the take home message here is garden structure is important, right? Whether it's just a bed or your whole landscape. So my front yard, which is what I'm showing here, it's really small. I live in Raleigh, small quarter acre lot, but my house is small. So the yard actually feels generous. Many weekends, it still feels like it's too much work, but um, it's it's very structured and order ordered. If you knew me better, and some of you do, you, some of you do, you know that I like weird things, off the wall things. I'm also kind of a plant snob. I don't want to have a yard that looks like anybody else's, right? So, and I'm trying to make the most of my space. So, my front yard is very ordered. It's very structured with straight lines. Um, and I have this perfect square of turf, actually on either side of my front walk. This is a front walk. This is a walk that goes over to my driveway. Um, I've got some really large steppers here. And then this perfect square of turf is fine, but then my borders, where it's not turf, like and within straight lines, it is this wild mess of color, things that are blooming all the time. I've got edibles in there too that I planted, hopefully some for me, but a lot of birds get it. But also my neighbors know they can come and take some. My mail carrier knows he can pick strawberries as he comes through. But look how crazy this is in between. 
but everybody who passes love it because it's ordered, right? The beds are structured. The lawn is structured. I can get as wild as I want on the inside. They don't care. To be fair, I don't live in a neighborhood with this crazy HOA, but a lot of times you can be just as um, wild with the plantings as long as you present it in a structured way, right? So in terms of plant composition, when we're designing for pollinators, it's really interesting to me that pollinators and humans really want the same things out of the garden, just for very different reasons. So in this chart on the left, I'm showing that what pollinators need, what humans want in the middle, and then how that translates to garden design, right? So pollinators need different flower shapes and sizes, right? Dinesha just gave you a quick overview of some of the pollinators. Remember, we have over 500. They're in all different shapes and sizes, and they often require different flowers in order to uh, get their insect nectar or the act of pollination requires very specific bees, right? So you need to provide a lot of different flowers just for that. In terms of what humans want, we love variety and color. So in the garden, that translates to drama. It's the only place I like drama. Not in the life as general, but just in the garden, right? Um, pollinators need pollen and nectar through the spring and fall, like the nation mentioned. And so what we want as humans is we typically want our gardens to be as showy as much of the year as possible, right? So that translates to in the design, we need to figure out how to carefully craft wave after wave of blooming things from March all the way through till frost, right? And that usually means we have to work in not just perennials, but trees, shrubs, and perennials, right? Pollinators also need winter habitat, right? Those who are living in the stems or laying their eggs in stems. We also don't want our gardens to look like meh in the winter, right? So we want some interest there as well. A really great way to do that is to incorporate ornamental grasses, right? So easy to grow. And I should make a note here that all the plants that Dinesha and I recommend, they're things that are easy to grow. We would never recommend plants that are fussy that you need to just like plant and then pray to get them to like take a hold. It's like, who wants to do that, right? So we wanna give you plants that are easy, right? So grasses are fabulous, right? And then pollinators also need diversity of flowers for best nutrition, right? So different flowers, I guess different pollen has different nutritive value, correct? correct. Right? So if you just planted a lot of one thing, it's like you going out and only eating cheeseburgers, right? I mean, I guess that's not a very healthy thing anyway, but like, let's just say you went out and only ate salads. It's not a very balanced diet. Chris, are you taking notes? Mr. I have chocolate for breakfast. <laughs> right? so, so lots of different things for different types of nutrition. Um, we have, of course, like lots of interest when that equates to high diversity of planting, right? Now, what I'm showing on the right side of the screen is just different ways of building up layers in the garden. And just really quickly, what I'm showing is the plan view drawings are what's on the left. And then a side view or the elevation is on the right. And it goes from the top with very little interest, less diversity and less seasonality. So that might just be a ground cover up top, right? And then as you go down through, I'm just taking away some of that ground cover and I'm adding more and more height and layers. Now, what might be interesting for you to know is all of these designs are correct, depending on, and correct and awesome, depending on the context, right? Where do you think we would, where do you think that top one would be okay? Can you think of a scenario where just like a very simple planting would be fine? It's kind of a weird question, but let's just say you are zipping around the belt line going 90, no, sorry, what's the speed limit? Whatever the speed limit, that's how fast you're going. If there are medium plantings, there are thousands of either cannas or daylilies because if you just planted three, people zipping by, it's just not gonna register, right? So that top one, even though it has less diversity, is fine for that application. But if we're talking about pollinator gardens, you really need to be looking at the layered ones down here. More layers, more variety, more interest. 
This is also how you want to design probably in your yard where you might be looking at it for a long time. You might be sitting outside and enjoying this space. This will captivate your attention more than one of the top designs, right? So again, layering is, is key. So diversity of flower forms and sizes, like I mentioned, we talked about the different kinds of flowers, but design-wise, you also want to consider different flower forms, right? If you only planted round-shaped flowers or only lily-shaped flowers, that would be okay, but it's not nearly as interesting if you start to mix some spiked flowers and some rounded flowers and some flat top things together, right? So go ahead and mix it up, experiment. Whatever floats your boat, do that, right? And then Dinesha mentioned seasonality. And of course that always sounds appropriate and logical when we say that, but frankly, it's probably the hardest thing to get a handle on. Because if you do a Google search for a plant or look in a plant catalog to do some plant research, they only show what the plant looks like when it's in bloom, right? And they usually only show a zoomed in view, right? So you can't see what the plant fully formed looks like. So one of the hardest things my students have is trying to figure out, well, yeah, this false indigo has amazing flowers in spring. We can get that from our research. But when the flowers are done, what does the plant do? Some plants actually die back to the ground at that point, right? But the Baptisia has really beautiful foliage, right? This is awesome, like light green, blue cast, which is a really great color combination with other colors. And then later on in the summer or early fall, some Baptisia have really fantastic seed pods. And I think these can be even cooler than the flowers. And I'm like a nut for Baptisia flowers. So that tells you how much I love the pods, right? So that is what takes time and experience. And the research that Dinesha was talking about in terms of logging, what do your plants look like over the year? And so I used to be more great at my record keeping. And now I'm just swamped. Some people might say I'm just lazy. You can decide which one you want to go with. It's busy. Um, so what I do now is I'm just constantly taking pictures with my phone because all of those are time stamped. The location is logged. When I get a few free minutes, I start transferring those pictures into files, like plant files on my computer. That's what helps me keep the seasonality in mind, right? So in the book, we have this great chart that talks about, okay, generally, um, deciduous plants, they, they might have this awesome display of flowers in the spring, maybe in the summer, they might have good fall color. And then in the winter, it's not like they have nothing. There's still structure. And sometimes the structure is really cool and obvious. And sometimes it's not so great, but you, you can make that call. Broadleaf evergreens tend to have like this massive flower display in the spring. And then it's evergreen the rest of the year. Needle evergreens, yeah, they provide green throughout the year, but they don't really do anything else, right? So if real estate in your garden is primo and you don't have a lot of room for many things, maybe skip that one. And then you can see this other thing. So the perennials can do lots of different things depending on which ones. The grasses are really cool because they will definitely pack a punch in your garden in the summer. In the fall, they just go dormant. They've got awesome inflorescences. Well, they're starting to turn, they have inflorescences, and then they go dormant, but they're still standing in the winter, right? You don't cut them back until you start to see the new growth coming up, and it takes the whole spring for them to come back, right? So come on, any plant that you have to prune just once a year, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great plant, right? So we talk about that in the book. While you're designing, or let's just say you're sort of designing in your head, um, but you're shopping for plants, right? I think it's really helpful to make these seasonality charts. If you like write down all your plants and you have the plant name and the heights and when it blooms and what color it blooms, it's really too much information for your brain to take in and to sort through. So I like doing these seasonality charts and I'm showing you two kinds here. So one is the hot mess kind when I'm like in progress of designing, right? I'm old school, I still design by hand. As I'm coming up with plants, I don't want to like shift to my computer because you know what's gonna happen, I'm gonna get on Facebook or do some weird searches and then several hours are gone, right? So I wanna stay on my task, so I stay at my desk. So I'm drawing 
And as I'm putting in plants, I just make this chicken scratch <laughs> list off to the side. And I just do my squiggles of when the plant is gonna be showy in the garden, right? And then as I'm like, if I'm doing it for a client, um, then I'll type it up. So I put in some extra information there about the size, but again, I'm just showing when the plant is showy. So even if it's a non, uh, if it's a client that's not familiar with plants, which a lot of our clients are not, they can look at this and say, oh yeah, something is going on in the garden every month. She's got all the seasons covered. They don't need to worry about what the plants are. And then, then I've given them other information in the design packet to explain what they are, right? So this is really helpful. And what I like about this is the messy one is really helpful while you're coming up with your um, plant palette because you can do this and say, oh my gosh, my spring is completely empty or I really don't have much winter interest. That signals to you that you need to go back and adjust your plant list so then it's perfect when you go buy your plants, right? Again, we wanna help you spend your time, energy, and money the right way the first time, right? So I'm gonna go through these really quickly because you're all awesome plant people, but spring blooming plants, you know, don't forget your woody plants, right? So the red bud, the red maple, and then also all these um, uh, perennial plants. And so the other thing to think of, especially if your garden is small, you don't need to provide everything in your garden, right? Bees can fly for miles, right? So you still wanna make it easy for them. However, we have so many maples in our town and so many other like red buds and other plants that they will find nectar and pollen elsewhere. But if you've got room to add some in, please, please do, right? But don't think that if you can't provide something, the bees are gonna die because they can get it elsewhere in town. We're just trying to help them out as much as possible. Now, Denisha mentioned the mountain mints. They are fabulous. Some people might think, okay, but are they really that showy? Come on. When you compare them to these other things, like on a scale of showiness, is it something you really want to include? But I will say that it is one of the pollinator favorites. And it almost doesn't matter what species of pollinator. I have several mountain mints in my yard. There can be 15 species all on a plant. I can go weed underneath one and be knocking the plant with my elbow. They don't care about me at all, right? They just fly away, they come back. And what's nice about the mint is, yeah, it's probably not like showy showy, but a lot of the species have this really beautiful gray leaf, which is a really fabulous foil for all these other hot colors that are going on in the garden. So it's almost like your brain needs a rest a little bit. So it's like, a lot of visual energy, a lot of visual energy, and then, aha, a spoonful of sherbet, and then visual energy, visual energy, right? So it's really nice to pair grays and whites with um, hot colors. Also, you might have read that um, pollinators need like really vibrant colored plants. And there's some different information about that, but it's interesting to us that some of the favorite pollinator plants are this really cool rattlesnake master, which is white. Um, of course, the mountain mint, which is gray. And then also the button bush, they're really popular pollinator plants, but they're not that vibrantly colored, right? So something to keep in mind. And then uh, as Denisha said, late summer and fall is one of the hardest times for our pollinators because it's so hot, it's so dry. A lot of our gardens want to just give up the ghost at that point. So it's important to work in the asters if you've got the room. Um, be very careful, like again, they don't read, the plants don't read the plant book. So those symphiotrichums, they might say they only get four feet wide, but they will probably spread to six, right? So just give them some room. Goldenrod, super easy to grow, but it's bossy, right? And so it likes to spread. I plant mine in pots in the ground, just to curtail that a little bit. Uh, Joe pie weeds are awesome. And then all the purple cone flowers that we can grow here, they will start like late, late spring or early summer. They will go till frost. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And then the winter interest, right? These are some of the best grasses for this area. Um, the muley is native, the prairie drop seed is native. And the prairie drop seed, that little beautiful one in the upper right is incredibly tough. So we've done a green roof pollinator habitat on top of our student union on campus. And it, that roof has been challenging. There's been um, irrigation issues. And then all during COVID when the university rolled to online, no one was up there for 15 months. It was not irrigated. 
Hydroxide still going like gangbusters, right? So it's like, yes, that's a that plant gets an A plus in my book. Feather reed grass, sweet grass, these are all fabulous. And the blue grama grass, who cannot love those little floating eyebrows? They're the best, right? Absolutely. All right. So what I love about human built gardens, and I'm wrapping it up. I know it's like it's getting hot in here, or maybe it's just in my mask. I don't know. <laughs> but um, there's been quite a bit of research that says. Gardens that are designed and built by humans in urban areas are often more diverse than in nature. And so what we've created basically is like the 7-Eleven <laughs> of like pollen and nectar for pollinators, because this isn't gonna happen in nature. We're providing lots of extra nutrient and energy for the pollinators, and that's a good thing, right? So it's amazing what we can do in our home gardens. A couple quick notes about plant selection specifics. Um, Interesting to note that uh, research has also shown that when a plant, when it comes to being native or not, plants don't care, right? It's not like they're flying around with little passports, going, oh my God, we can't visit that plant, right? So they don't care. So the native plants are not critical when it comes to pollen and nectar. However, right, they are very important when it comes to supporting the lower trophic levels, providing larval hosts. And then the other um, support mechanisms that they do. So for example, this pawpaw supports the swallowtail butterfly. So in my mind, when we think about, well, how do we design moving forward in climate change? It's really, I think the best bet is to plant a lot of different things, right? Gardens are dictated by how much water they get. We're getting so much rain here. We're getting way more rain than we anticipated. Um, and it keeps getting a little bit more every year. Uh, we have more extreme weather conditions. And so it doesn't always make sense to pick plants based on what was here pre-settlement. That kind of just assumes that the world is static and it's not, right? So it's like, how do we make the best decisions moving forward? Perhaps planting a lot of different things. So native plants, of course, but also plants that are adapted for this area that do well, that still support our pollinators. And then like Denisha said, uh, avoid multiple worlds of petals, right? The open-faced ones are better. Uh, these ones, if there's good pollen and nectar in there, really hard for pollinators to get in there. Um, I also think that Denisha found research that said um, the pollen is higher quality when it's in straight species, right? So not cultivars. So if you were concerned about getting the highest quality pollen to your pollinators, don't do cultivars. Right? Okay. Sorry. Please. Say one thing real quick. Absolutely. So something I neglected to say that Anna's getting at is that not all pollen is created equal. And I won't go into too much detail because now I'm taking Anne's time away and I'm already taking enough. But when we talk about pollen, not all pollen is created equal, just like not all food is created equal for us. So bees really have to hunt and pack and find their their favorites, but also they have to visit a bunch of different plants to get the, you know, the most protein they can get from those pollens. And if people want to know more about that, I can go into more detail after I have. Uh, so. Yeah, awesome. No, th <laughs> thank you for that interjection. So pollinator garden installation, obviously, let's say you want to take on a brand new pollinator garden, really huge, buying plants can get quite expensive. Uh, one trick I like to do is buy gallon size perennials, but then divide them up spread them out a little bit more. I'm also a fan of taking donations from my neighbors, right? We do lots of plant sharing that way. But another cool thing is, which a lot of people are doing now is uh, direct sowing gardens or sowing pollinator meadows um, or overseeding, right? So you can go to online sources and buy predetermined mixes like in bulk, so much cheaper than going to a garden center here and buying like 3 million packets, right? Um, and you can get like a pollinator Seed mix, um, they're always really good. There are some native seed mixes, but they tend to be more expensive and the germination rate isn't as high, right? So it's almost better to get um, the general mix. And then what donation I often do is then go in and buy single species seeds. And we supplement that with um, other natives or other plants that we wanna see in there. And something that I do at my house is I direct, I mean, I overseed with zinnias, right? So it's fabulous annual pollinators, love them. And I just throw out seed in the spring. I don't even work it into the ground, water it in, it's fine. It gives me this whole other layer of flowers. 
super cheaply and they bloom all summer till frost, right? So it's really fabulous. And also by taking up all the little extra spaces in my yard, it's much harder for weeds to push their way through, right? I'm really covering all the ground that way. And then two slides quickly on garden management. Um, if you think about the tasks that we like to do or that we have to do in the garden, with what Denisha said about where bees live, it's like, as, a, as we get into like late winter, we really wanna start cutting our grasses back. We wanna spread more mulch out in our gardens. We might even wanna start planting early, but that can really disrupt some bee habitats, right? So it's really, can you think about pushing those back a little bit, right? Until after they have emerged from the ground, which is around, what do you say, 57 degrees, but you know, our winters and springs are just crazy. Like the temperature goes up, the temperature goes down, right? So it's hard to tell when that is exactly. Well, what we have seen some gardens do, some public gardens is they still cut their grasses back early, but then they bundle them and still let them stand in the garden. We thought that was a really clever solution, right? So it's really just pushing those early tasks back just a little bit. And then if you absolutely must spray, trying to do it on non-windy days. And as Denisha said, late in the day, early evening when the bees aren't flying, that's always best. And then again, not deadheading as you get to the end of the summer. So there's still um, the seed heads left for the birds in the winter, right? So no garden is too small, Denisha already mentioned that. Even if you have just a balcony or even if it's a single container in a sunny area, if you plant one plant in your garden, pollinators will come, we guarantee it, right? And then you do have the power to make a difference, right? Um, what you do in your yard can inspire many, many other people, right? So what you do does matter. And the pollinator plants that you put in your yard, helpful on their own. But as we create more and more pollinator areas in other residential gardens, the impact is huge. So please, please take that to heart and go out and enjoy your gardens and create buzzworthy gardens. So thank you so much for coming tonight. We are happy to entertain any questions you may have for us at this point. Now. And she hugely exhales and fogs up her glasses. <sighs> back on. Yes. And we will take questions. And if you do would not mind, repeat the questions so our online people can hear because yeah. the audience does not have sure. the microphone. So here are the questions. Yeah, let us have it. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you take that one. Gonna, of course, you're going to throw it to the scientists. Of course. Uh, does light pollution and noise pollution affect our wildlife and our, particularly our insects? I would say that it absolutely does. And this is now we're outside of my comfort zone. You know, I'm a horticulture person. So I, we, Anne and I both study insects, but we come at insects from the plant side. Uh, I've read a, a lot about how, you know, too many lights can disrupt their, um, their cycles. And so, you know, I mean, I don't know what we can do about that living in the city. You know, I'm not going to go and, and advocate for the removal of our street lights, but maybe if we are cognizant of when we're leaving our own light, you know, like porch lights and whatnot on, you know, I don't really know what else to say about that other than, you know, we, what we are doing is probably influencing our ecology and our animals around us to, to more of a degree than we even understand. And unfortunately, I don't know a lot about it. <laughs> you know, you hear a lot, the, where I've read about it the most is actually with turtles, right? That are hatching on the beach and they're going the wrong direction towards, towards the beach houses with their lights on rather than towards the ocean where they see the moon. So that's actually where I've read the most about that, but I imagine that our insect populations can be similarly influenced. Absolutely. That's a great question. Others? Shock and awe, Anne. We I, just I guess. Shock right. and awe. Usually, they just need like a minute to get warmed up. How about, are there any, oh, we got one here. Hey, I have a question. If you have lawn, and you know with a lawn that you've seeded it, you, you've aerated it, you've done all this stuff for years and years and years, and you've treated it differently because they require a lot of chemicals and everything. How, and you want to convert that grass, 
into a natural area? How long does it take for all that stuff to dissipate in the ground so that you can That's get there? So the question is, if you've been, uh, in particular, maybe if you have a lawn service that come, you know, and they, they do a lot of mowing, a lot of blowing, a lot of putting down of pesticides, herbicides, you don't always know what they've done. Usually your lawn looks better afterwards if you like a nice tidy lawn. How long would it take if you wanted to convert that lawn that's been pretty highly managed, right? Maybe for years and years and years. How long would it take to convert it to something beautiful like Ann was talking about uh, with a more meadow approach or... I think it would. So I do come from a turf background uh, and I, you know, I hate to say, well, it depends on the chemicals that they used and when they put it down. Right. But if you were thinking about taking your lawn into uh, where you want to just maybe start just by overseeding with some zinnias or other flower seeds that you like, and you don't want to be, you know, cause you can always tear up the tear up the grass, dig out the soil, put in new soil, stick a plant in the ground, right? So that would help to negate most of the chemistry that's maybe in that soil. But if you wanted to just try the approach where you're letting stuff go or you start seeding over top of the grass that's there, which I think would work because essentially you're, you've got a seed bed there. The best thing to do would be wait a couple seasons and the more water that it gets, the more likely the pesticide is going to be to, you know, to, to um, dissipate into the soil or, you know, unfortunately run off into surface water. Most of the stuff that they're using is not super persistent. So if you were to stop now, for example, putting pesticides down in the spring would be a fine time to think about starting to plant into that soil. And I I would agree. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. 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 And you can always, you know, start transitioning your bed space a little at a time. You don't have to think about taking on a huge bed at once. Right. And that makes it a little more manageable. Dennis, was there a question online? Yeah. Um, okay, we had a question about early on um, when you showed the photo of insect hotel. Uh, somebody asked if an insect hotel needs to be cleaned out by us, uh, and if so, when? So that's a great question. Do insect hotels need to be tidied up and cleaned out, and if so, when? As a matter of fact, I've I've read that they do. Okay, so super honest. I have a fourteen year old son. I have a lot of foster animals. I never clean out my insect hotels and somehow the insects still always come back, but you are supposed to clean them out and you would want to clean them out after the insects have had a chance to hatch. And so probably we're talking about, you know, late spring, early summer is a fine time to clean them out. And then you'll start to see them being populated again. And oftentimes you can tell because you'll see those little, um, you know, the little sticks or whatever, the holes will be plugged with mud. That means they've been used. And then uh, if you see a little hole, that means something came out of it and that's time to clean it up. Right. So in some smaller bee hotels, they're like little ones, like they're made where you can unscrew them and the layers come apart. So it makes cleaning it out easy. But for the larger ones, I don't know if this is true, but some people have tried putting in like little tubes of wax paper or straw so then they can just clean it out. Does that work? I have no idea. Like okay. I said, I never tidy mine up. I just hope for the best. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love the thought of someone who has time to do that. And I right. think that's wonderful, but <laughs> I'm not, not that us. person. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Fabulous. Other questions? This is such a great range. Dennis, you got another one over there. Uh, yeah, also from the internet. Uh, do needled evergreens have any value for pollinators? So maybe habitat? I don't think so, though. I mean, it's just like a prickly plant, so it's not really a very welcoming house. So in terms of like plants for habitat, it's going to be plants that have little crevices in them and the needle evergreens aren't going to provide that. I mean, conceivably, if you've got an evergreen and it is not packed against the ground densely, maybe underneath it, they could nest, but they actually, most ground nesting insects prefer having some sun beating on their little home and they like that, uh, that slope that's got a little bit of the sun hitting it. So yeah. I, I can't imagine other than maybe nesting under it, that yeah. it would have much. Yeah. Hab- you much know what they are good for though, is like a lot of needle evergreens, like the spreading junipers is like, they're a little bit up off the ground and there's a little bit of airspace. Yes. Snakes love that. Ooh, yep. So it's either <laughs> ooh or ah, depending on how you feel about snakes. They're not pollinators. So I'm going to just leave it at that. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they don't pollinate. We don't care. No, no, that's <laughs> Other questions? So maybe if you have like a secret squirrel question, we're happy to answer things one-on-one. We'll be over at the book table if anyone wants to buy a book. 
Uh, we don't have the square thing because we we're just squares. We don't we aren't that technological. We're old, we're old fans, school. We, we can take cash, <laughs> cash and checks, and we can answer your questions over there. This is more philosophical one. Okay. Um, In that case, Anne offers to answer it as uh, well as interpretive dance. Maybe in science, have good um, so because of the amount of new housing developments that are being built, and the, there seem to be a lot of HOAs kind of coming in yeah. to do those, and have any of them ever approached you? Have you had to do any consultations with trying to educate them? There's been no response of over from HOA. Oh, yeah, no. So, so the question is, you know, with all the new development that's happening, like have like developers or contractors like ever consulted people who know about pollinators? And no, because it's just really a money thing for them. Not to make them super evil, but they that's not their wheelhouse or interest, but it should be like as a homeowner buying that, it's like, okay, well, how can we make that garden a little bit better? But I would counter that if they did like, you know, not just the bare bones foundation, it really wouldn't cost that much more to add another layer of perennials. The curb appeal would go up. They could probably get a little bit more money for the house. And it would, well, I mean, all the houses right now in Raleigh are selling like this, so that wouldn't be an issue. But um, that's something that, that, that they certainly could do. But some of those HLA um, residents and stuff were the real Nazis. <laughs> that that is that true. Some of stuff in their yard. They want shrubs and trees and what's easy to mow. Exactly. So I, I love that. So some HOAs are really picky. And so let's just say you live in a really cantankerous neighborhood where they say no perennials, right? You could still do add like another layer of shrubbery. So let's say the original foundation plants are this big. You can actually step it down to another shrub that is pollinator friendly, be more seasonally interest because they're gonna put in evergreens, but you can add in some deciduous things so you can still get it in there. You just need to tackle that problem another way. So I love that. So Anne, you might just briefly on the, the philosophical question, mention the project you're working on down in Pinehurst where they asked you to come in. Uh, the Environmental Institute of Golf did ask for some very, Thoughtful design? Yeah, actually, so that's true. So uh, the USGA is building two new facilities on Pi in Pinehurst, and they are very environmentally uh, minded, and they are all about educating visitors and their staff and the residents of Pinehurst through their landscape. So it's actually a high directive for them to make a very pollinator-friendly garden. There's this huge area that's dedicated just to pollinators, right? So as someone parks, a little bit farther away, there's winding pathways that will take visitors through the landscape that will show pollinator habitat, um, stormwater uh, BMPs, and they're gonna be restoring this beautiful pine grove and working in a wire grass ecosystem there too. So yes, yeah, some clients are spot on and they have awesome vis visions as well. So. So the yeah. hope would be, of course, that that would inspire others, right? Exactly, exactly. Because millions of people come to Pinehurst, so they want people to have a fabulous experience while there, but they're hoping that through all the educational signage that they'll have, they'll take those lessons back to their hometowns. Absolutely. Dennis. Also <laughs> Get a dog. Is there a question there? He just said, he, he just said rabbits. We do. Anne's got a great one. Do I? Oh, yes, I do. So, how many of you? So, uh, the question is uh, rabbits come in and they tend to go after echinacea, everything. Yes. <laughs> so, how can, how can we address that? And just as a side story, um, I have a funny one where I bought all these different echinaceas and the bunnies ate all of my expensive new cultivars, but did not touch the street species. It's like, what? Anyway, so what I do in my yard is I go around to my neighbors who have those sweet gumballs dropping from their trees. And I also have a lot of pine cones in my yard and bunnies do not like walking on sharp things. So I circle all my new plantings with either sweet gumballs or pine cones, and that saves them. 
Now it will not save the, it will not protect the plants from deer. Deer don't care. <laughs> they will step over everything. But the rabbits, that certainly helps with the rabbits. And it's free. I'm all about free solutions. Yeah. And sustainable. And sustainable, yeah. Well, that, that takes the economic part of sustainability. That's it's right. free. That's right. right. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, one more from the internet. Okay. Um, there's a person who has a uh, forested backyard and they would like ideas for small, for a small space uh, in their backyard. Planting. So a uh, small forested space in their backyard. Well, first thing I would say, perhaps you should buy the book. Yeah, buy the book. For starters. <laughs> but if it's really shady, I mean, I guess our first question would be like, well, how shady are we talking? If it's edge of the forest, it's a little bit easier to solve. So Denisha mentioned some shade loving plants that are bee friendly. There's some other ones that we could talk about. Um, but it also depends on like what the canopy is because sometimes it's really hard to plant under established trees because those bigger trees are water, I was gonna say water hogs, that's not very nice. This is a safe space, right? They'll take up all the water, they take up all the nutrients. So it's harder to get new plants established underneath. So or, or pine, they drop those needles hell a lot. Right, right. So I would say like um, uh, the hellebores that the nation mentioned are really tough. They love dry shade. They're evergreen, they bloom in the winter or early spring, which is great. Um, epimediums, thank you. Oh my God, that's my favorite. That should have been at the top of my list. Those are fabulous. Um, toad lilies are also great. Um, hardy begonias, hostas, although the deer really love hostas. So if you've got deer, that's an issue. Um, yes, polygonatums, absolutely. Yeah, there's lots of stuff, lots of stuff. Cool. Other. Is that it for, it for, it for questions? So that sounds like it's a good place to it's, stop. It's a good place Thank to you. end. But if you've got other ones, we'll be at the table for a little bit. Signing books, selling books, whatever you want. You can ask us questions there as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. So much.